Hey, I'm Caleb Anderson, and this is the Spirit Farm Podcast. We are here for busy professionals who want to do their dreams, crush their goals, but still not compromise their relationships and their spiritual life. So we bring you episodes like this one, where I interview a new friend of ours. His name is Mark Owens. And Mark is a breath of fresh air. Mark, uh, this is my first time meeting him. And uh, I knew of him as a very successful real estate investor. But his journey is super unique. He became a drug addict at 12 years old. We're going to get into that and talk about his journey uh, all the way through getting out of prison, leveraging his time in prison to learn and grow, getting out of prison, uh, marrying his high school sweetheart, who he had broken up with uh, back in high school when he knew that he was on a path to prison. And uh, but then it comes full circle. They have this great love story. They're still married today. And he's he's done really well in the real estate realm. He's got some great practical tips on how to manage your mind, your thoughts, um, how to go from low to no self-esteem to strong, high, uh, healthy self-esteem. I know that's going to be an encouragement to you. One thing I just want to drop right here that he shared with me after the podcast interview was over, but it's so good. I wanted to I wanted to drop it here in the intro. Mark actually reached out when he got out of prison years later and had made his money and his fortune and whatever. He reached out to the police officer who arrested him. He sent him an email, and at first the guy didn't respond, probably because he thought it was a setup and that Mark was going to do something bad. Uh, But then Mark replied again and said, hey, I don't know if you got my last email, but I just wanted to tell you thanks. Thank you. Thank you for arresting me. Thank you for putting me me behind bars because you saved my life. And then he was able to have lunch with the guy and they become friends. Uh, The police officer now, uh, he's much older, but he thinks of Mark as a son. Just a cool story. So you can see a little bit of the trajectory of bad turning into good and Mark turning around his life. And he just wants to share that journey and some of his tips for real estate investment, if that's of any interest to you toward the end, uh, for free. I mean, he coaches people for free. You can find Mark Owens, REI on Facebook, and it's a free Facebook group that you can join, Mark Owens, REI. And without further ado, uh, this is my conversation with Mark Owens. Mark, thank you for joining me on the Spirit Farm podcast today. Hey, man, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, Most people are listening, but some will be watching on YouTube or Facebook or somewhere. And uh, what they will be able to see is behind you, there's this image. Uh, What what is in this image on your uh, your green screen behind you? Yeah, thanks for thanks for uh, asking, you know, because I was looking at it and I realized that, you know, when I was talking to you before, I was actually pointing in the wrong direction because everything's kind of in reverse. <laughs> that, right, that right there is my home away from home. That's a condominium I own in the Cayman Islands and I've had it for a few years and that's that's my happy place. That is the happy place. Now, how did you come to own a condominium in the Cayman Islands? Why did you choose that? What do you love about it? Well, it's actually, it's located at a dive resort and I used to go there, I scuba dive and I would go there and rent them. And uh, when I stayed there and it, it, like you can own them, it's not a timeshare. You can actually buy them and then you can rent them out if you want or not rent them. And uh, I had, I had always looked into it and I thought, man, you know, I really, I really like it here. I'd really like to buy one of these, but it didn't make any sense like financially as far as like a rental property goes. Is that because you can't do like Airbnb there or what? Yeah, it's just, it just doesn't cash flow as well with the expenses and, you know, there's seasons and all that stuff. And I mean, and if we talk about this later, like when you compare it to Baltimore rentals where I own most of my rentals or really all of them, uh, you you just can't beat that market, the Baltimore market. So gotcha. I stayed at this unit to two bedroom, two bath, and I just, I fell in love with it. And I thought, man, if this thing like ever comes for sale, you know, I think I'm going to want to buy this. And so what happened was I got home. And it was a couple months later, you know, I just did a search and that unit was for sale. And I thought, oh, <laughs> shit, this is like, you know, like this is like the law of attraction. <laughs> something's, good, something's in the air. And, uh, you know, I called the agent and I, I actually I sent her an email and I said, you know, I'm just curious would the owner consider any kind of financing or anything like that. And I'm a real estate guy, man. That's what we do. <laughs> and, and she emailed me back and said, no, absolutely not. And I was like, all right. So like a couple, maybe two, three months later, I did a search again. I saw the price had decreased by like $10,000. So I sent her an email 
And I said, yeah, I talked to you a couple months ago. I want to make an offer. These are my terms. Uh, I'll give the owner 50,000 down. I'll give him 2000 a month principal only. And then in four years, I'll give him the balance, the balloon. And she called me up and she said, listen, she says, I'll present your offer to the seller, but I can assure you he's not going to take it. And I was kind of cocky, you know, I'm just like, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm this in my first rodeo. And I told her, I said, look, you know, that's what everybody says. And then I put in the offer and it gets accepted. And it's like, this is like nothing new for me. And the next morning she calls me up and she says, well, you know, I think I had some good news for you. <laughs> he accepted, you know, the owner accepted your offer. I was like, all right. So, so where where are you in those payments? Have you made your balloon payment yet? Or are you still? I got, got one year to go. That's one year to go. Oh, yeah. Are you are you loving that investment? You get there enough uh, yeah. even you know amidst what? COVID? What I what I had to do was I had to just step back because I was always looking at things through the prism of an investor's eye. Yeah. And and analyzing it like that. And what I did was I said, listen, this isn't about the money. This is about the lifestyle. This is about me. Yeah. yeah. This is a, an investment in my lifestyle. And uh, you know, I mean, I want to live there, you know, and I got two more years and I'll be living there like, you know, half, the, you know, close to half the year. And, uh, you know, it'll be there and, and then another house, my wife and I are buying in Florida and then traveling around the rest of the planet. You know, the other <laughs> so that's, uh, but I mean, you know, it was all real estate that made that lifestyle possible for me and created the wealth where I could, you know, make those types of decisions. But that, that was just like a lifestyle choice yeah, for me. Yeah, Some people yeah. can buy the, you know, the real expensive cars or the big ass house. And I didn't, I've always lived below my means and I'm getting to that stage and age where I want to look out a little bit more for me. You know, I, I'm not looking for necessarily the most bang for my buck money wise, but I'm looking for the most bang for my buck, like for me. Yeah. Experience and, uh, wise. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was like a grand slam. So I, I want to talk about the real estate and how you got there and, and the, the, the unique journey that it took, the challenges that you had as a younger man, um, but just real quick, you said that you found that spot because of diving. So, uh, I, I know that there's people, I have some adult friends that are getting into diving now for the first time. And is, how did that become such a passion for you? <laughs> That's, uh, I, I'm going to show my age by, by <laughs> talking about this. But when I was a little kid, there was this guy named Jacques Cousteau. Sure. That had these TV shows on like every Sunday night at seven o'clock or eight o'clock and, it was him and his, you know, like sons, like diving all over the world and seeing, you know, like sea life. And that was something new for most of us, like in the early seventies. Yeah. And I saw that and I just thought it looked so exciting and it looked, uh, you know, like, man, I, I really want to do that. I want to dive down and see like, you know, sharks and skates and rays and big fish and little fish and reefs. And then, uh, I, you know, I bought a book, the scuba divers Bible, which I actually still have. I bought it when I was like 10 years old. And, uh, <laughs> and then, you know, I went through a phase from like 12 to 30. And, you know, when I was in my early thirties, I went back to college and you had to take two phys ed classes. And one of the choices of the many choices was scuba diving. I thought, huh. man, this is it. This is my shot. And, uh, you know, I enrolled in that and that was, I got certified around 1994 in a quarry, it was 38 degrees and I was wearing a wetsuit, which meant when I jumped in that water, all that 38 degree water went inside my wetsuit. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, like I jumped in, I was the first one in and then I was like, you know, I'm looking around. And I'm like, man, I don't know if I can do this shit. You know? <laughs> it's like, this is really effed up. You this know? is it's really cold. cold. And uh, I'm just like, you know, but I'm manning up, you know, it's like, oh, I'm, like I'm just going to sit there and take it, you know, and, uh, and then other people jumped in and, you know, they were like, ah, and I'm just like, I just toughed it out, man. And then uh, I think if somebody else would have got out, you know, we'd all probably got out, but nobody wanted to be the first one. So we, how long we, did you stay in that first time? Yeah, to do two dives. I think they were probably like 30 minutes each. God, do a minute dive and then get out. And then 38 degrees out. is cold, man. It was, it was brutal. But you know what? There was actually something, a benefit to that because in the future, when I did, uh, dives in the Atlantic Ocean, like in the mid Atlantic around the Maryland, Delaware, area and i would jump in and the water's like 55 degrees yeah. everybody else is complaining about how cold it was and for yeah. me it's like man, this is like you know this yeah. is nice yeah. you know yeah. because i was yeah, very comfortable the yeah. other stuff so it really increased my uh, comfort level as far as like the variety of temperatures that i'll dive in 
Well, and I like too that it was that it was your passion as a little kid. It was something that sparked in you as a little kid, and you got the book when you were ten, and yep. then and then when you could when you found yourself in a position where you could actually do it as a thirty year old man, like the, like the childlike passion came right back, and you went for it. Oh, it was awesome, man! That's awesome. All right, so something else that happened when you were a kid, when you were twelve years old, did I get that right? When you were twelve years old, you started down this path of addiction. Uh, that became that became a a good stretch of time for you. Is that right? That yeah, that's true. I uh, started smoking weed when I was like twelve. Do you want to give you the whole like timeline? Like yeah, a, yeah, sure. Yeah, a, I'll give you like the short three minute version, and then Please. you can talk about whatever part perfect that you find is most interesting. So I started smoking weed when I was twelve. Lived grew up in Baltimore City. Uh, we moved to Baltimore County when I was like thirteen, which is it was really just like maybe fifteen miles away, but. I went from being a city kid to living in an area that was kind of rural okay. at the time. And, uh, and it was like, the kids seemed much younger to me, even though we mm. were the same age, you grow up a lot faster and a lot tougher in the city than you yeah. do in the suburbs. Yeah. And, uh, you know, by the time I was like, I started smoking cigarettes and weed when I was 12, 13. And is that because your parents were not engaged? You just had the influences around you, older siblings. What, what brought that at such a young age? It was uh, the neighborhood. You know, I mean, the that's how the kids my age were doing it. Wanted to fit in, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I didn't fit in in other areas. You know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't real athletic. Wasn't, uh, you know, like really good in school. Like I'm smart, but I just like school was boring. Yeah. And, you know, I think in the third grade they wanted me to skip a grade, and then my mother wouldn't let them because mm. I was just so bored. You know, in the class. Mm. And uh, so the, um, so you know, 13 was like drinking, and then 14 it was. You know, the drugs are different today than they were in the, like, I guess, early 80s. But it was like Quaaludes, Speed, Valiums, Placidils, and uh, acid, mushrooms, inhalants. And then get kicked out of school when I was 17 in my senior year. Moved back to my grandmother's house in the city, in the neighborhood where I grew up in. And February of 82, a couple of months before I turned 18, I started shooting cocaine. Mm. And about a month later, heroin. Mm. And uh, so I was a 17 year old junkie and that lifestyle brings you to all the places that you swore that you would never go mm. as far as like, you know, lying, cheating, stealing, just, you know, just doing terrible junky type stuff. Yeah. And uh, went to prison the first time. I guess I was like 20 and I got a, it was like a 14 or a month sentence or a year or something. I did 10 and a half months. Got out, got back into the same stuff, and uh, I wound up, you know, living in the streets in Florida. I was homeless, you know, just living in the street. Spent sixty days in jail there for uh, I, it was called a strong arm robbery, but they eventually reduced it to theft. And mm. got out of there, living on the streets. Ended up, I don't want to bore you with a long story, but I ended up getting a job where I traveled up and down the East Coast working for a show that did security work at horse shows. Okay, and. Uh, Met a girl in Pennsylvania, quit the job, moved in with her. She was, she was like, I guess, 19 with two kids, like a five-year-old and a two-year-old. And uh, her and I ended up living together in a studio apartment with her two little kids. And my drug use continued and escalated. And it ended up with, uh, I did a bunch of robberies. In I did some stuff in Pennsylvania. And then the you know, they were looking for me. I actually escaped from the, I was out on bail for some other stuff up there. And I escaped from the sheriff and the bail bonds when they come to my house to lock me up. What kind of and robberies then, we talk in market? Are, are we like, like convenience stores? What, what is that? Or more organized than that? No, it was, it was uh, I mean, I started off with a bank mm. and, and then after that, it was just, you know, I mean, I'd actually robbed drug dealers before that time. And wow. uh, I think I robbed the first drug dealer. I was like 18 years old. Wow. And uh, I actually robbed a store when I was like 18 too. And then I didn't do it anymore. because so I thought, man, this is just too easy. Like I could get addicted to this. You know, just, you know, <laughs> you know, the hand your bag of money and off you go. And, uh, mm. but then, you know, when I was like 24, I was just like out there and just didn't care anymore. And, you know, my last month on the street, I was, uh, I was robbing stores like every single day. I'd steal the car for a couple of days and then stay in a hotel, get drugs, you know, until I just, couldn't stay awake any longer or whatever. And then, you know, sleep for a few hours, get rob a store, get by drive. And I was just kind of all in at the time where I just thought, I'm just going to do this until I either OD 
or get shot. You know, like being uh, being arrested wasn't even part of the equation. I just thought like, there's no way. It's like you know, if, if I'll, I'll fight till they shoot me. You know, what I mean, mm-hmm. and uh, and so they had this thing back then. It was the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska. Yeah, around 1989. Yeah. And they were hiring anyone that would come up there. Like if you would come up there, it didn't matter, man, they're going to hire you to like just wipe oil off of ducks and rocks and everything else. So I'm thinking like, man, you know what? Maybe I'll go out to Alaska. You know, feds ain't going to find me out there. They're not going to be looking for me like, you know, wiping oil off of ducks. And uh, so uh, a friend and I, this girl, her name was Barb, who I'm actually still friends with. Her and I went out and, uh, I had a car that I'd stole a day or two earlier. And I told her, I was like, look, tomorrow I'm going to Alaska. I'm just going to drive across the country and just rip and run till I get out there. You want to go out tonight and, you know, party. So she said, yeah. Went out, robbed the store, went and bought some drugs on the way back to the motel, ran a red light in a stolen car. You know, it's like dumb as shit, right? It's, <laughs> who does that? You know, but it's like, man, we just got our Coke, you know? It's like, man, let's go get high. And uh, so you're not really being rational at all. And I, probably been awake for two days and uh, ended up getting locked up. And, you know, that's a story in itself, but mm. I was locked up maybe a month, attempted to escape out of Baltimore County detention center. Where is that? Uh, it's in Baltimore County, Maryland. Oh, Baltimore County. Yeah. Yep, okay. Baltimore. Yeah. My accent, the Baltimore accent, we sound really stupid and illiterate, but that's <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I try to enunciate the T in the name Baltimore <laughs> because if I just say it the way locals say it, it's like, either Balmer or Balda or Baltimore. Bald. <laughs> and people are like, we're not, you know, like, like they look at you like you have some kind of speech impediment. It's like, no, it's just the way we talk. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I, I ended up spending six months on lockup for the attempted escape thing. And which in lockups where you're locked in a, in a room by yourself for 23 hours a day Oof. and you get out for an hour. And so that was like my life for like six months. And, and a string of things started to happen. And this is kind of like, I, I think it's called synchronicity mm. or maybe, maybe it's part of the law of attraction, but I'd always been trying to like, I, I didn't want to be this person. Mm. You know, I wanted, I wanted to be like, you know, normal and like up everything I touch. And I, you know, I'd been to rehabs. I get kicked out of half the drug rehabs I've been into. I've been, I'd been homeless. I'd slept in abandoned houses. I, you know, ate Christmas dinner in a homeless shelter. It's like, you know, and at AA, NA churches, Moving to other states, hardly any of my girlfriends did drugs. You know, it's like they were normal. Mm. And nothing I did worked. And, I, you know, I just kept looking on the outside for all these answers. And what happened is I'm sitting on lockup. And my attorney comes to see me and we're meeting. And I'll never forget it. He looks at me and he says, man, what the fuck is wrong with you? Can't you even stay out of trouble in jail? Like you're already locked up. Can't you even stay out of trouble here? And I'm like, I'm, of course, I'm like looking at him like, you know, I don't know what to say. It's like, I guess I can. I guess I'm just a f- And he says, uh, he says, don't you know if you play your cards right, you can be home by the time you're 30 years old and be young enough to start a whole new life. Hmm. And that, that's the, that was like a turning point for me. Hmm. When he said that, that's where I stopped and I thought, man, if, if I can be home and like, five years, I will be young enough to start a whole new life. Mm. And so it kind of got the gears turning for me, like in the right direction. It's like a big ship, you know, the big ship yeah. just you turn on a dime. It takes time. Sure. And this was the beginning of that turn for me when he said that, and he didn't know it at the time. It, he was just pissed off. And, uh, yeah. but what he said resonated with me and it, and it gave me hope for the first time I'd had in years. Mm. And uh, so then what happened was, I was sitting on lockup and you got plenty of time, nothing else to do. So I got plenty of time to think. And I'm just, I'm thinking like, man, who the, f- like, who am I? Like, I don't even know who I am. Like all that I know is I like to get high, I like to drink. I like to chase girls and like, that's what I do. And, uh, and, uh, and I was just thinking like, what kind of person am I? Like, am I a bad person? Am I like just a piece of shit? Like what kind of person am I? And then I started thinking about it and I thought, well, what were you like before you started getting high? Like, who were you before then? And I thought back about when I was like 11 years old. 
And I used to go knocking on doors. There was this guy named Jerry Lewis that had telethons every year. It was, it was on yeah. TV, for, yeah. you know, like a day and a half. Younger people are going to have any idea. <laughs> a lot of people have heard of Jerry Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I would go around, like I had a coffee can and I put like, you know, a little label and it said like muscular dystrophy association or something. And I would go around knocking on the doors and collect money. And I never took a nickel out and I would take mm. it down to this high school and dump it in the container. Hmm. I mean, I was like, I was a good kid. I had a mm. newspaper route. I used to cut grass in the neighborhood. If it snowed, that was like money falling out of the sky. I'd go knocking on doors, shoveling <laughs> snow, washing cars. Like I was a hustler, but it was like all legit stuff. And, you know, yeah. <clears throat> I wasn't stealing or anything like that. Like I was a good kid. Didn't get in trouble in school. And I started to think, well, that's who you are. That's who you You're are. that good person. That's who you are. That all that bad shit was a good person under the influence of like really effed up drugs. Yeah. That's not who you are. Right. And so that started to give me some kind of idea of like the kind of person I am. That, that again was like the ship just turning a little bit more. Yeah. And then uh, what happened was I started thinking, well, like what do people do that don't do drugs? Like man, what the, what do they do? Like, do they just go and watch TV every night? Like, that sounds boring. And, uh, <laughs> unless you're like, if you're smoking weed, it's all right, but it's just, it just looks boring. And that, so I thought, well, what am I going to want to do? And I started writing down the things that I wanted to do when I was little. And one of the things on the list was scuba diving. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if somebody was kind of dumb, it's almost embarrassing to say it, but I mean, when I was like nine years old, I had a little bird book. Roger Tory Peterson was the author. And then pictures of the birds and the names and descriptions and all. I'd go down, you know, like around my neighborhood and say, oh, that's a northern cardinal. And I, like, I really enjoyed, like, figuring yeah. out what these different kind of birds were. So yeah. I wrote that down. Like, that was something I liked. Was it just and, the birds or was it animals in general? Because part was, of the like, seed diet. You know, I like the animals in general, but the birds was kind of like a specialty because – I lived in the city. We had, we got birds, you know, but, you know, but you're not going to see a lot of other, you know, like deer and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. You know, you're not raccoons. You're not going to see a whole lot of that kind of stuff. And uh, so the birds were like what we had available. Yeah. And, uh, and it was fun to just kind of like figure out what they were. So I wrote that down and some other stuff that I, that I'd wanted to try and just never really had the opportunity to. And then, uh, which led me to when I got to college after I got out of prison and I had that opportunity, I was like, hmm is what I've been wanting to do this my whole life. You know, I just, mm. I was, I went to a party from the age of 12 to 25 and, you know, then I had to pay the price for the stuff that I did, which I deserved. Uh, and so, so, so the ship is turning, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the kind of person that I was before then I'm writing down things I was interested in. I wrote down every good thing that I could think of that I ever, that I'd ever done in my life. It wasn't a big list. But I wrote down the stuff that I could think of because I wanted to focus on that. It's very easy. And this applies to everybody. Like your, your life, your, your story is like a book. And on one page is all the bad things you've ever done. You lied to your mother. You stole from your grandma. What, they cheated on a girlfriend, whatever it is. And then the other page is the good things you've done. Like you have somebody that you didn't even know changed their tire in a parking lot because it was a lady and she couldn't do it. So you stopped and helped her. Like little dumb little things like that. But every day you wake up and you have a choice on which page you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. And for years, I was just focused on the bad page, just playing the same tapes in my head. You're a loser. You're a piece of shit. You're stupid. You F up everything in your life. And I started to focus on the good page. You went out and, you know, collected money for people that you don't even know to help them. You had newspaper routes. You did this. You did that. I mean, you know, you were in the Cub Scouts. Like, so I started to focus on the good part. So what did that look like, Mark? When you are, are you like waking up in the morning and going like, like you have an actual journal or is it I just did. kind I of had, that? Now I had paper and pencil. Yeah. Paper and, and pencil. And you're like, yep. I'm going to do good stuff today. Yep. And are, were you intentionally planning them out? I was, uh, I, was, I was just at the time, it wasn't that I was going to do good stuff in the future. I was really trying to, at the time, you can imagine like if you, if you, build a house out of wood, you can only build it. You know, you can't go 10 stories up mm -hmm. if it's like you know, two by fours. It's just yep. this foundation isn't that strong and it's going to topple over. Yep. My, my foundation up until that time was just like, it was like little mud bricks with a little bit of straw stuffed in the hole. It wasn't, <laughs> wasn't very, you know, yeah. durable. Yeah. And so I spent a lot of time redoing my foundation, which is how I feel about myself, how I look at myself, how I'm going to focus on myself. Yeah. Because I thought I can't go, 
you know, I can't really build a great life if I'm going to feel like shit about myself the whole time. Like I have to change the way I feel about myself. And part of the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to focus on the good, not the bad. Hmm. And it was hard to do because I had a lot of bad. Yeah. But I just, you know, there was some tricks for me, like they were tricks that I learned. And uh, one of them was I'm not a religious guy at all, but I've read uh, I've read a lot of stuff. And one of the things I remember was, and again, this isn't like a religious thing. I'm not preaching to anybody, but I remember that Jesus, you know, the, the devil tempted him. He went out for like 40 days and the devil was tempting him. And Jesus said, now, get behind me. Like, you yeah. know, yeah. I'm not listening to you. Yeah. And I, I've thought about that and I thought, how can I apply that to myself? Yeah. And so I would get those, we call it stinking thinking, like in the, in the drug room thing. And I, I would get these like negative thoughts, like, man, if I punch that guard hard enough, I can knock him out and take his keys. <laughs> and I'm thinking, and that thought would start to creep in. And, and I would literally yell like, like, no, like, like at that thought, like uh, it was, I mean, imagine if your dog's about to pee on your pillow, right? Yeah. You're not going to just sit there. You're no. going to jump up and grab uh, the dog and that's yell. Right. And that's right. I started yelling uh, out loud in my cell at that yeah. thought as yeah. though it were separate from me. Yes. And that thought disappeared. It, hmm. Like I, I was taking control of myself for the first time since I was a kid. And when that, and when those negative thoughts came to my mind, I would literally scream out loud at those thoughts as though they were sitting right next to me and they left every time. I love it. Yeah. There's another one of those, uh, there's another one of those famous scriptures about taking the thought captive, right? So that's what you're, it's like grabbing the thought yelling at it, shouting it back, putting it behind you. Um, that's, that's genius. And did you see as you did that intentionally that all of those negative thoughts started to get smaller, less frequent, and then that's, eventually disappear? That, that is exactly, I mean, it's almost like you did it yourself. Maybe I, we should turn the podcast around and I should be talking to you. <laughs> that's exactly the way that it happened was those thoughts became less frequent and less you know, I don't want to say intimidating, but yeah. less strong yeah. this time on. So eventually yes. it was like, I wouldn't think twice. Of, like I wouldn't like do anything like bad, like that stuff. Like I wouldn't ever today. It's like, huh. that would be like, you know, just, just not who I am. Yeah. And, uh, but there was one more piece to the puzzle that uh, was like the game. Like this was the thing that clinched it. I got off lockup and I was, I convinced myself that then I'm going to do the right thing. I'm, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to figure this shit out. Like, I'm not going back to that life. I'm going to be the person that I was when I was a little kid. That's who I am. And I found a book on the, uh, the pod or tier. It was a book on top of one of the tables that you sit at. And I picked it up and it was called, You Can If You Think You Can. Hmm. And the author's name was Norman Vincent Peale, who hmm. is more famous for a book that he wrote called The Power of Positive Thinking. And it was a self-help book. And it's the first self-help book that I'd ever seen. So I picked it up and I looked at it and I was like, you know, in, you know, reading the back of it where you can like, you know, you can have the power to be the person you want to be if you believe, you know, all this stuff. Man, I read it. I got plenty of time. I'm in jail. I got nothing else to do. <laughs> you know, I mean, there is stuff to do, believe me. Like you can get high, you can drink, like you can play poker all day. But it's like, I didn't want to get involved in any of that stuff. So, so I read this book and halfway through the book, the author convinced me that I can, if I think I can, mm. I have to believe in myself and mm. that I can do it. And he just gave examples of people where they believed in themselves and they were able to change things in their life. And halfway through that book, it was just like, I mean, it was like a bolt of lightning just hit me and changed everything, mm. changed the way I looked at myself, changed the way I looked at the world. It was like, it was instantaneous. It wasn't like a dimmer switch. It was like, bam, the light switch came on and, you know, next thing I know, I got 10,000 watts of light hit me in the, in the face. And uh, wow. It, it's, and it's never, it's been like that ever since. I mean, that guy, it really made a, I, I just can't under or overemphasize how important that was to me at that time. So it sounded like <clears throat> just the way you described it, that the, the negative thoughts, those were a little bit more of a dimmer switch. Like they got less over time, That's but then, correct. but then you had this like breakthrough awakening moment where yes. it was like, I, if I believe that I can change, I can change. And all of a sudden it was just like, you believed it and there was power. And, and I believed it. I believed it. I, I, I just swallowed the hook, line and snicker. Hmm. And it's, 
<clears throat> this is kind of like the example I use when I talk to my friends and like a lot of guys understand this, some don't, but um, I think it's, it's kind of universal. Like imagine if you're like getting ready to get into a, a boxing ring with somebody and you're looking at the guy and he's like, you know, he's huge and he's tough and he's never lost a fight. If you go in thinking, I'm going to kick this guy's ass, I'm going to, his own mother is going to recognize it when I'm done with him. I'm going to knock every tooth out of his mouth. And then when he's knocked out, I'm going to keep beating him. And you go in with that attitude, you might get your ass kicked. But if if the other attitude is, man, shit, I'm going to get in there. That guy's going to clean my clock. I'll be knocked out in 30 seconds. I don't even know why I'm here. You already lost a fight. It's yeah, already you already lost. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because you don't believe in yourself. Believing in yourself is what can make the difference. You still might lose, but you got a hell of a lot better chance of winning. That's right. If you believe in yourself. Yeah. This book gave me that. It gave me the the ins- inspiration. It inspired me. And so what happened was I was always looking outside of myself for the answers. Mm. I looked at churches, rehabs, AA, NA, girlfriends, moving to different states, trying to hang out with different people, listening to different music, like I was always looking on the outside and this book kind of turned it around and I started looking on the inside. Yeah. And once I did that, like that was the key. That's what uh, I need. It worked for right. me. I'm not saying it worked for everybody else, but that's what worked for me. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so that, that aha moment hits and the lights come on. Did you just keep, cause you, how much more time did you still have left in, in prison? Yeah. I spent, uh, that was around April 20th or 22nd of 1990. I got locked up September 8th, 89. That was around, I just got off locked up. That was around April 20th or 22nd of 90. And I think I got out, I think it was June 6th of 94. It was June of 94. So it's been like another four years and a couple months I was locked up. So what did you do for those four years? Did you keep rereading that book? Did you get more books? Did you start talking to people? Did you start making plans? How, how did I started you- making, And I started making plans. And this is like, yeah, this, I mean, this is going to sound kind of crazy, but it's like, that's what I did. It's in the prison system. You can go to college. Hmm. I'm like, man, I'm here. I'm going to get a college. Like, I don't know if I'm ever going to do anything, but I'm going to go. It's, I was looking at like, in my mind, I was looking at it like, okay, you're not in prison. You're in rehab. Hmm. I'm going to rehabilitate myself. I'm not going to waste this time. I've I got to do the time. And I knew I deserve this time. I deserve it every day of it. Hmm but I'm going to make the best of it. I'm not going to waste it. I'm not going to just sit around watching soap operas all day. It's kind of funny. You see these guys are like literally like hardened criminals, like killers and sitting in cells, watching soap operas all day. Just like the weirdest <laughs> damn thing. And they, they'll sit down at dinner and talk about it. Do you see general hospital day? You know, what we're doing? I'm just like, huh? it's like, this is crazy. Like that is crazy. Your and you're talking about like soap operas. You know, like, you should be, talking to you know you should be at the chapel <laughs> yeah and, uh, yeah and uh i just i so i thought i'm gonna you know i'm gonna do this time i'm gonna get the most i mean i was reading like i mean i, I read moby dick from front to back hmm. it's the most boring book in the history of mankind <laughs> there's a hundred pages telling you what the damn whale looks like but I thought, you know, I was like, I'm behind, you know, I need some culture. In my life. I need, <laughs> I need some culture. Yeah, I'm just going to power through it. You know? and I did. I powered through it. You know, I mean, I read everything I get my hands on. I, I think I knew all the Greek and Roman gods, you know, reading books on mythology. And it's just like, you know, Hadr- I read a book on Hadrian's Wall, which separated like, you know, the Roman Empire from the barbarians in the north. And I read a, it was like a, 400 page book about a wall. It's like, who the hell does that? <laughs> but it's like, it's either that or you go out in the rec hall and play spades and listen to these guys talk about how they're going to sell drugs when they get up down and get away with it. And it's like, mm-hmm. I, don't, I want to avoid that. So yeah. it's like, I'm going to yeah. focus on this stuff. Yeah. And it, it got to the point where I actually was able to save up some money when I was locked up. And before, uh, before it's maybe uh, six months before I got out, I, my, I had saved up five hundred dollars, and I asked my grandmother to open up a bank account for me. Hmm. So I opened up a bank account. Then a couple months later, I asked my grandmother. I said, "Look, I, I want to get a loan from the bank. I want a secured loan. I want to borrow five hundred dollars from the bank. They can keep my savings as security, and then I'll make payments back to them every month." And the bank said, okay, I mean, how can they lose? I was, my whole thought was I'm going to start establishing credit. Hmm. I don't have any credit. I didn't have bad credit. I had no credit. Hmm. I never had a credit card to mess up. 
I never had a car payment to mess up. So I just like, but I didn't have any credit at all. So I thought I'm going to start building credit because some of the books that I had read, like I think it might've been like the barber next door or something like that. Like so one of these books had me thinking like, man, you know, you got to get your financial life in order and you, you know, credit helps to do that. So I opened a damn bank account from prison and, and borrowed money from a bank. Mm. Uh, I got with my current, my wife, my one and only wife, uh, we were together in high school and we, and we broke up because I was a knucklehead and I broke up with her. I knew I was, I knew I was going to jail and I, and I knew she was going to go to college. It just wasn't going to work. And we broke up and I wrote her when I first got locked up, I wrote her mm. and just wanted to kind of say, here's how things, here's my, how my life turned out. You know, I'm going to prison for a robbery and blah, blah, blah. She wrote me back and said she thought she saw a picture of me, like a wanted poster with a drawing. And she said, man, just thank you. Oh, oh <laughs> <gosh>. <laughs> it was. That looks and, like my ex-boyfriend yeah, from high school. <laughs> it was. And, uh, and But she was doing good. You know, boyfriend, you know, uh, finished up college, had a career, you know, like she was doing well. I was like, you know, I'm happy for her. I'm really happy. You know, everything turned out like I thought it would. Here I'm in jail. She's got a great life. Hmm. And right before I, uh, maybe seven months before I got out of jail, I sent her, I wrote her a letter and just said, you know, <laughs> hey, I'm getting out. Hmm. And, uh, you know, this is like some of the stuff I've done. And, I'm, you know, I hope things are really good for you. And I hope you're happy. And I hope, you know, that, that life has treated you well. And she wrote me back and, uh, you know, said, yeah, things are good. You know, don't write me anymore. Hmm. So, I'm, you know, how do I put this? I don't give up easily if there's something <laughs> that I want like like that. You know, it's like I don't you know, it's like, OK, you can say no, but let me come back at you a different way. And that's like the drug addict thing, I guess, like the dope fiend. I don't know. I mean, I guess there's some benefit to living that lifestyle. And uh, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to write her a letter. And I'm going to tell her everything that I've always wanted to tell her, but didn't have the balls to tell her, like, mm. which was the truth, like why I really broke up with her, not the bullshit story that I gave her back then. Mm. I figured I owed her the truth. Mm. And if she never writes me again, that's okay. Because at least I, you know, like I was able to apologize and just, you know, tell her what really happened and let her know that it wasn't her fault. It was hundred percent me. Mm. And a couple weeks later, she wrote me back and said, well, you know, we can, you know, we can correspond. And uh, <laughs> you know, we ended up, we got together when I got out and we got married two years later. No way. Yeah. That's and now, incredible. And now we've got a 22 year old son who just graduated from Alabama. <clears throat> and he's about to start his career. And uh, he's an amazing, an amazing son. Oh. Far better than I deserve. Oh, that's so good, man. That's yeah, so it, good. it actually bring tears to my eyes thinking about it because it's just, uh, you know, it's like we, it doesn't matter where you've been, you mm. know, it's like, it's, what matters is what you're going to do today and, mm. and what you're going to do tomorrow. Like, that's the important part. You know, it's like you can't change the past, but you can learn from the past and you can, like, with one of the things that I like to do is take my past and use that as a tool to inspire other people. Yeah. Because some people, you know, maybe they came from worse circumstances than I did. Yeah. I mean, my family life wasn't that bad, but some people had horrible family experiences growing up. Yeah. And a lot of times people use that to define who they are. Hmm. And But it doesn't have to be like that. Yeah. You know, we, we make our life at the end of the day when you're, you know, hopefully 110 years old, uh, how you get there is the result of thousands and thousands of small decisions that we make along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And if you make thousands and thousands of bad decisions, like eating junk food and smoking cigarettes and, and drinking a whole bottle of wine every night, you're not going to make it to 110. You know, those all those little decisions add up to one huge decision. And, uh, and so I'd like to be able to share my story with people in hopes that it will show them that, they can change their life. They don't have to be stuck. Whether and and their idea is stuck. It doesn't have to be as extreme as mine. It could be like a nine to five job that you hate with a boss that's stupid and all that. And you don't have to be like that either. Most of the people listening and watching uh, probably 
maybe have not gone to prison or not been stuck as in that kind of a specific way as you <laughs> described, but I all of not. Yeah. But all of us, but all of us know what it is to be stuck. All of us know what it is to be assaulted by negative thoughts. All of us know what it is to have those negative things. And so I think that the, the guidance that you've shared with the shouting down the negative thoughts, get, getting them behind me, and then looking for, looking for those kind of like, um, I don't know, it, it, it feels to me like it was kind of, I don't know, I, I think the term you used was synchronicity or like, like this divine intersection where just the light goes on and you're just woken up or you're just realized. And then you did the work from there, those small decisions of investing and reading and going to school and believing and I, I, I it's relevant to all of us man it's and it is inspirational i appreciate you kind of investing your life in that way yeah let me i just want to i want to talk about the synchronicity a little bit more i really believe that i mean like i don't know what it is i'm, I'm not saying that you know somebody's up there pulling the strings and we're all just a bunch of puppets and I'm, i don't i don't know what it is can't explain it but i know that sometimes it's kind of like the law of attraction. Like right now, like there are, you know, tens of thousands of red Jeeps out there and you might not notice them, but I guarantee you, if you buy a red Jeep this weekend, you're going to start seeing them everywhere. That's right. They yeah. were already there, but yeah. now that you're, you've turned your attention to them, you're going to notice them. And I think that that applies to a lot of different things. If you decide, man, I'm going to write a book or I'm going to be an artist or I'm going to open up a used car dealership, whatever it is. Yeah. And you start talking to people about it, connections are going to be made where, hey, my uncle has a car dealership. You should talk to him about open one. He could probably show you. You know, it's like like that stuff happens. And one of the things is, I don't know if it's age or wisdom or just like dumb luck, but I started noticing, like I started to recognize this, like, man, I was just thinking about this and then this happened. And I'm thinking to myself, like, you know, is this a sign? Like, is this, you know, and I'm like, I don't like, I don't snooze on it. Cause if you snooze, you lose. Like if I'm thinking like, man, you know, I'd like to, you know, do this. And then somebody says, Hey man, you want to do this? And that's what I was thinking about. Yeah. Rock climbing in Colorado. Yeah. I was just thinking about rock climbing. <laughs> like, yeah. When, when are you going? Like, yeah. let me get it on the books. And uh, it's, it's like that stuff happens yeah. and people just don't notice it. But if you, if I guess, I don't know if it's an intuition or if I'm, I think somebody called me an empath once. I didn't know how to respond to that empath. <laughs> Is that like a psychopath or something? Like, what do you mean? Well, I mean, look at it this way. It's probably, perhaps it's part of what made you so vulnerable to the high, to the drugs early on is what makes you so uh, open, aware. Um, it's, it's what helps you to pay attention in your life. So many people just aren't paying attention and they're just well, going through the motions. I agree. I agree. I, th I think a lot of the reasons I did drugs was to kind of dumb down because mm. I was too aware. I mean, I remember mm. when I was like 17 thinking like, ah, it seems like the more I know, the more unhappy I am. Mm. You know, like, you know, it's, if you're just living in your own little world and everything's good, it's easy to be happy. But when you start thinking about like, you know, poverty and people that are abused as children and the people that are, you know, dying in wars and you start thinking about all this like negative stuff that you become aware of. Yeah. It kind of, it can bring you down. Yeah. And, and I, and I was very aware of like, you know, like the pain and suffering in the world and it just, it, you know, it affected me then it affects me now when I think yeah. about it. It's, yeah. it's just horrible. And so I try not to think about it, but, uh, but I think the drugs were part of what allowed me to not have to do that was, yeah, you just, you know, you're just focusing on like, you know, your immediate little party world and all that stuff. And you're not thinking about all this other extraneous external stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I want to make sure that we get to kind of what, what you have done and what you built since you've gotten out of prison. Uh, and we're in, a, we're living in a time right now where in this post kind of quarantine COVID era and everyone's reevaluating everything and work from home. And should I do this job or should I, should I invest in this and Bitcoin and that, and that, and, uh, people are, are, are looking for, um, different means of thinking about money, thinking about job, thinking about work and real estate has always been there. What attracted you to real estate? And then for you, what made it take off? It was, uh, 
<clears throat> the stock market to me was just bullshit. I mean, I'd invested money in the stock market and it was just like a crapshoot. You know, it, it's like right now we have all these internet geniuses, you know, with the cryptocurrency and all this and they're, you know, they're outsmarting the, you know, the Ivy League MBAs that work for hedge funds, but it's not going to last. You know, I mean, the average portfolio manager can't beat the S&P 500 index fund with a team of really high IQ guys that have been doing it for years and they can't even beat the market, 80% of them. How am I going to beat the market? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got out, you know, I, I, I don't want to go too much into it, but when I got out of jail a few years later, I was in the IT business and I was actually teaching computer certification classes in colleges all over Maryland. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was getting paid very well for it. Saved my money, invested in the stock market, made a lot of money, started to lose a lot of money, took everything out. And I had to do something with it. And I thought, well, what if I buy like rental properties? I, when I was little, you know, little like 17, I wanted to do that. I was thinking like, that's my key to, you know, being well off. It, you got to go back in my neighborhood, you know, when you're like 13 years old, 11, 12 years old, like we had our own self-imposed like glass ceiling, which was, man, if you can just get a job driving a forklift at Pepsi, like you're set. Huh. Like that's all, that's as far as we could think is like driving a forklift at a factory. Mm. If you could do that, like you're at the top of the food chain in our neighborhood. Like nobody talked about like go to college or opening a business or buying rental property. Like nobody talked about any of that stuff. We were, you know, like, you know, blue collar, uneducated, you know, like that's what we're going to do. And, uh, and we looked forward to it. You know, we thought, you know, we'll be doing good. And then with the, so coming from that background, and getting into the IT stuff and having a period of time, like times where I was like literally living on the street in California, I was sleeping in abandoned houses. I was doing the same thing in Florida. I was, mm. did it in Baltimore, uh, in and out of jail and rehabs. And, and I know what it's like to like literally like hitchhike across the country with no money and not eat for two days. Like I've done it. Mm. And so when I started making money, like I had a scarcity mentality, like, man, I got to keep this. Like, I don't know how long it's going to last, but you know, like I want to make sure I can eat. And yeah. so I didn't go out and buy the big house and expensive car and all that stuff. My wife and I literally, we still live in the same townhouse we bought when I was making $15 an hour in 1996. Wow. I was a lab technician then. And uh, I got out of prison, went to college, majored in, bio, majored in biochemistry, became a lab technician, saw there wasn't any money in that, switched to IT. And then that's where I started doing well. Hmm. So back to your story about the, why did I start to invest in real estate or what got my interest? It was because the really, the stock market was too much uh, uncertainty in it. And with rentals, I could sit down with a spreadsheet and I could project the cash flow, you know, how much I'm going to make every year, principal pay down, potential for appreciation. I never counted appreciation into my equation, but, uh, but I was looking for a 30% cash on cash return. It back then it was a fifty thousand dollar house rented out for eight hundred a month. Mm. Like if you could find that, that's good. And you only had to put ten percent down back in nineteen ninety two when I bought my or two thousand two when I bought my first one. It was ten percent down plus closing. And uh, I bought my first rental it was a three unit, three apartments in a big garage that was rented out to an HVAC guy. And uh, my original intention was I wanted to buy enough rentals, like ten, so that if I lost my job that I had enough money coming in to like, you know, pay the mortgage and put food on the table. My wife wasn't working. Uh, our son was a couple years old and she went back to school to become an RN. So she didn't work for like five years. So it was all on me. And that also that pressure, I mean, it was a good pressure. Like I got to look out for my family you know, I got to mm -hmm. look out for my wife and my son and, yeah. and get her mortgage. But that pressure can also be stressful. Yeah. And, I was an independent contractor, which meant I could lose my job like that. Yeah. And there's no, you know, it could be from a car accident. I could get hit by a car. I could say something inappropriate in school and get fired. It could be anything. And, uh, or they maybe they'll find out I went to prison or fire me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I, I was terrified that like, man, I'm at the time I was making 150,000 a year, been out of jail six years, seven years, making 150,000 a year, terrified. I'm going to lose it all. So I started buying rentals and, uh, and then like I had this, my own cap, I was like, man, if I can get to 10. And then as I started to get closer to that number, I was like, well, what if I get to 20? Like, why stop? Like, I, like the thought never occurred to me. Like, you don't have to stop at 10. I, I didn't know any landlords, like the first couple of years, 
I mean, think about this, 2002, 2003, there's no Facebook, there's no meetup.com, there's no Craigslist. You know, uh, I didn't even know about RIAs back then, the Real Estate Investor Association. I didn't know about any of that stuff. And uh, if you Googled it, it wasn't even Google back then. I think I used AltaVista or a web crawler. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's going back, isn't it? That's going back. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, I just, I had this, you know, self-imposed kind of thing, like, Never thought you could go further than the forklift. Never thought you could go further than 10 houses. And then as I started to get closer to that, like, I get 10 more. And then, well, what's to stop me from getting another 10? Like, there's no limit. And then I started learning, you know, I started meeting other people, which is the most important part of this business. There's two parts of the most important. Networking is the most important part. And mm. having a stellar reputation is equally important. Mm. You can know a million people, and if they all think you're a piece of shit, Nothing good's gonna happen. You can, you might, if you only know two people and they think you're wonderful, not much is gonna happen because you only know two people. You got to know a lot of people, and you got to have all those people respect you and know that you get shit done. You don't play games. You don't steal or lie or cheat. You know, you're just very transparent. Yeah. And uh, and when you do that, it's the law of attraction. I mean, people want to do business with you. Yeah. And I get it all the time. People want to partner up with me to buy everything from shopping centers to single family houses. And, and I, I usually don't do it. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of partnerships, but I really appreciate the fact that people ask me if I'm interested in doing it like that yeah. to me, is like, you know, I couldn't have even imagined that yeah. you know, 35 years ago yeah. and to have people that are successful, that are decent people, want to partner up with me on things. It was just, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I never take that stuff for granted. Yeah. Well, it's that's significant. Thing. That's significant, Mark. So <clears throat> you, you just said two things. The, and the second was uh, having a good reputation. What did you say the first was? Uh, the having a good reputation and the networking. The networking. That you want yeah, a lot of that's right. Know. Yeah. Mo- moving, moving around, being, being out there. And then once you establish those connections, um, following through, getting stuff done, being dependable, having that good reputation. Yeah. yeah that's it. And being honest. I mean, it's like the truth is like if, if I, if I hire a plumber to do something and we verbally, he says, I'll do it for, you know, a hundred bucks. And then he sends me a bill for 125. I, in my memory, it's like, I thought he said a hundred. I'm just going to write him a check for 125. Like I'm not even going to question it. I don't want this guy to say, yeah, Mark Owens, I told him 125 and then he tried to rip me off. You know, it's like, I'll, I'll pay him what he wants. Like I'm not going to argue with him about it. Maybe if I think he's screwing me, I just won't call him anymore. But yeah. I'm not going to create any conflict. I would rather lose the money than have to defend myself. You know, where I got to lunch and somebody says, yeah, you know, Rick said you ripped them off. And then I got to get into that thing. Yeah, like, right. no, I don't want that. I don't want any part of it. So I protect my reputation. I'll leave a lot of money on the table to protect it. My mm. reputation worth more than the money hmm. taking years and years and years to get to build a good relationship and a good reputation. It only takes one bad deal to screw it all up. Yeah. 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 Good for you, man. Okay. So if you're, if you were, uh, I mean, you are a real estate coach, so give us just like pull, pull the curtain back a little bit and you're talking to somebody who's interested in going this direction. Maybe they're going to keep their day job. Maybe they are interested in real estate full-time down the road, or they just want to do what you did and, and have a backup plan, a, a few sure. rentals if they lose their job or whatever. We're in, in 2021 or whenever, whenever someone's listening to this, where would you start right now? First thing I'll tell them to do is like write down the goals, like clearly define them. You can't say I want to invest in real estate and then look at office space and factories and warehouses and apartment buildings and single family houses. Pick one thing. I picked, I picked residential rentals because people always need a place to live. Always. And I'm in the C neighborhoods, maybe a little lower than that little, you know, right at C is probably my average because those people are always going to be there. Hmm. If you start renting in the A neighborhoods, the really, really, really nice neighborhoods when the economy and the shit hits the fan, those occupancy rates are going to drop. The rents are going to drop. People are going to be offering two, three months rent to move in. They're going to take a beating. And the C neighborhoods, the rents go up because the people in the A's are moving to the B's and the people in the B's are moving to the C's. And the people in the C's, they really ain't got nowhere to go. They don't want to get live in the hood. So the C's, there's more pressure on the rents go up. That was my experience in 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, all the way up to today. And, uh, so focus on one asset class. 
uh, then if I'll use Baltimore as an example, people say, well, invest in Baltimore because it's like a, it's a great cash flow market. That is true. But you can't just focus on Baltimore City. You need to focus on a very small area, maybe a, I don't know, 10 block by 10 block area. There's too many neighborhoods to try to learn at all. You just you can't do it. So you want to learn one neighborhood really well, meet with a real estate agent, have them set you up with an auto search so that every morning you get an email with any listings that pop up in that area. And then on Saturday or Sunday, just go drive by the houses and look at them, look at the addresses, look at the prices. You're just learning your market. So for instance, if you see that the houses in this little 100 square block area are selling from 120 to 130, and then one day you see a listing for 80, that ought to get your attention. Hmm. And the comps are, you know, 120, 130, this is 80. Better go look at this now. If you if you haven't studied your market, you're not going to know that. You're just going to say, okay, this one's 80, and you're just going to move on to something else. You might have just lost on a good deal. Yeah. So those are some of the things I would start with at the same time. And this isn't like one thing after another. A lot of these things you can all do at the same time. The other stuff you want to do is you want to start the network. Like you want to look up, go to meetup.com and just type in real estate. And it's, you know, hopefully it's going to show you some location specific place. Like if you live in Cleveland, it's going to show you some meetups in the Cleveland metro area that are related to real estate investing. And start going to them and start introducing yourself to people. Don't spend any money. Don't buy any courses. Don't do just you want to meet people that are doing it. You want to see the who's who. The if you want to spend money, I mean, like some people they just want to spend money. They want to buy the next cloth and sheets course or whatever. Like <laughs> but spend your money by taking people out to lunch. Hmm. Like you're never gonna do better than that. You you meet a guy that's got 30 rental properties has been doing it for 10 years. And you say, man, listen, I'd really like to take you out to lunch. Like you just tell me what's your favorite restaurant in the area. I would love to take you there. And you, so lunch might cost you 30 bucks, right? But the education you're going to get, you know, if you get to ask this guy questions for, you know, one or two hours and the relationships that you build, man, that, that you'll get that 30 bucks back a thousand times. Yeah. That's just, it is, it is when I see, like when I read a lot of these books, I still read some, but not as many as I used to. Uh, they never talk about networking. They never talk about your reputation. I mean, that's the most important stuff. Hmm. Like that's that's where it's at. And uh, so find people that have been doing it for a while. Here's this is just my opinion. Uh, I think that for myself, winners, people that are winners, it's not how much you have that defines winners and losers, it's your attitude that defines winners and losers. And for me, People that want to see you succeed and want to do well, they're the winners. Hmm. And, and the people that want to withhold the information from you and and not let you know because you, maybe you'll get a deal. They've already hmm. got a thousand houses, but you might get one. They're losers, man. I don't care hmm. how many houses they got. The winners hmm. want to see you win and the losers want to see you lose. And it's hmm. not the money. It's not what they have that defines that. Hmm. And so the winners, they, you know, somebody that's got 10, 20, 30, 40 houses, it says, yeah, man, I got the lunch with you. I really like Red Lobster a lot. <laughs> well, you know, like, don't sit there, shit, man. I was hoping you to get, like, Burger King or something. Like, Red Lobster, you know? And if he wants to take something out with his wife or his her husband or his husband, like, do it, man. Like, just buy him the damn lobster tail. Don't flinch. You know, yeah, yeah. don't grimace, you know, when he says that. Like, don't, you know, like, you know, this guy just gave you two hours of his life. Yeah, That's his most valuable asset, your time. You'll never get the time back ever. Yeah. Don't waste somebody's time. And yeah. and I'll, I'm going to tell you this. This is like a tip, uh, a tip for selecting tenants. If you're trying to rent a house or an apartment, tell the people to, and let's just, if for this example, say, okay, let's, I'll meet you there at three o'clock or my leasing agent will meet you there at three o'clock, whatever it is. Call me at two 30 when you're on your way there. If they don't call, don't go. Cause if they didn't call, they're not going to be there and you just wasted an hour of your time. Mm. And if they call you at 2.30 and say, yeah, I'm on my way, and, you, and you're there at 3, and it's 10 after 3, and they're not there yet, leave. Hmm. I Actually, I usually leave at 5 after. If they can't come to see the house on time, they're not going to pay the rent on time. Yeah. And uh, and they're already disrespecting you. It's like, and, and so I'll, I'll do that, and then I'll get a call at like 20 after 3. Yeah, we pull it up. Where you at? I'm like, I left. <laughs> like, we do that. I'm like, I left. The point was at three o'clock. Yeah, but I got stuck. You know, I had to get gas. I'm like, you know, 
you didn't know you were going to be late till you're 20 minutes late. I mean, it's like, you know, if I know I'm going to be late for something, I'm late occasionally. If I'm going to meet you for lunch at noon and I'm going to be 10 minutes late, I'm going to call you at 1130 and say, hey, listen, I'm going to be 10 minutes late. Just letting you know if you want to stop and get gas or something like I'm just I'm running a little bit behind. I'm, I'm not going to wait till noon After and the then fact. call you up yeah. and talk to you. And right. it's just it's disrespectful to people. Right. So that's right. that's one of the that's for me one of the most effective ways of screening tenants is just are they punctual? It's same with the job. Same with the job. If you're if you if you're going on a job interview, you're coming to me on a job interview and you show up late for the interview, you're going to show up late for work. I don't need you. If I can find a thousand people like that on Craigslist in 10 minutes, put up an ad. Hey, help one. It's okay to be late, man. My phone will ring off the hook. You know, it's like, Oh, so that's going to be one time. It's going to respect my time. That's so good. Mark, how many uh, properties are you up to now? You know, I, I started downsizing. Oh, you did. So, yeah. I had about 105 units hmm. and now I'm down to 42. Okay. And I'm, actually, I'm selling a seven unit building next week. Are you really? And yeah, I mean, I'm good. You yeah. know, it's like I got uh, the units I have free and clear and I got a bunch of money in the bank. I have no personal debt. My wife and I bought an RV last year. I'm waiting for her to retire. And then we're going to travel around the country for a few years. We're going to buy a house on the Gulf Coast of Florida and we're going to stay here and in Florida and <laughs> rent our RV. And, you know, hopefully if, you know, if everything opens back up, we can, you know, go around the rest of the planet. There's, I mean, the United States is just absolutely amazing. Everybody wants to go to like Paris and stuff. The U S is like 50 different little countries. Yeah. I mean, it really is like, you can't compare the people in Rhode Island to the people in like Wyoming. I mean, it's yeah, like, I mean, right. yeah, they're both Americans, but man, the cultures are like so, so different. different. Yeah. Well, and, and just, the, and the sites, right? The yes. sites, there's incredible yeah. I mean, beauty in a variety. I agree. And so, I mean, if so there's just, there's so much to see. I mean, just if you look at the Everglades or the Badlands or Utah or the Sequoias, I mean, it's like, or the Maine, the coast of Maine. I mean, it's just like, we have so much here yeah. and, uh, yeah. and every, and most of us still speak English. So it's like, you can get That's around. Right. Okay, you know? That's right. Well, let me know if you make your way to uh, the Scottsdale Paradise Valley area uh, in your RV, I'd, I'll yeah. buy you lunch. Well, we're, you know what? We're going to come out. I mean, that's that's going to be a, like our winter destination. Nice. We, we were at Scottsdale maybe four years ago. Listen, I, I don't care what people say about Arizona. Like, oh, there's no humidity. Man, it's freaking hot. <laughs> when, when, you're in a, when you're in a parking lot and it's like 110 degrees, it's freaking hot, man. It is hot. I don't well, that, care about humidity. It's like a freaking oven. But that's your first mistake, Mark. You can't come in the summer. That's just that's just I know, but people that, but people always say it's like, oh, there's big <laughs> humidity. I'm like, man, it is still really hot. Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> you know? right, right. So so we're gonna spend our like winter, you know, yeah. in like in Arizona. It will yeah. be like the snowbirds, you know. We'll just stay in Arizona one year and I, I don't even want to say New Mexico. New Mexico is not a very pretty state. <laughs> and uh, the, the white, you know, like the white sands like that is, it's beautiful. But, yeah. uh, but just driving like across 40, it's like, it's just, it's just, everything looks the same. It's kind of like the Northern Nevada desert. It looks very similar to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, so how, how can people uh, be in touch with you? Where, where, where can they find you and, and continue to learn more from you? Best place is probably, I got a Facebook coaching page. It's Mark Owens, REI. There's, there's a page in a group, go to the group. The page is just like a placeholder. Yeah. Uh, I'm not selling anything. Like, you know, you're not going to sign up for my platinum coaching. I mean, you can send me $25,000 if you want, but I'm not going to give you anything else. So <laughs> it's just, like, I don't do any of that stuff. I do some very small limited stuff, but it's like lo local people. Like if you want to invest in properties in Scottsdale, Arizona, like I'm not your guy. Like yeah. I don't know anything about the market. I just stick to what I know. Yeah. And, uh, but there's a lot of, videos on there that are more generalized like yeah. stuff about just networking and having a good reputation maybe how to evaluate a rental stuff like that which you can apply anywhere yeah but it but if like you want to ask me about i'm thinking about buying this apartment building in you know detroit like i don't know anything about detroit yeah. so probably couldn't help you and and that's a problem i mean it's like well it's not a problem but it could look like here's what happens in baltimore I want to sell a building. I want to get top dollar. The local people in Baltimore look at it like, man, I ain't buying that. He wants too much. But somebody from California will look at it and say, man, that's a good deal because they're comparing it to California prices. I don't want to be the California guy. 
or the New York guy looking at a deal in Detroit thinking, man, that's a steal. Yeah, that's a really good deal. When all the Detroit people are laughing about it. Yeah, right. You know, so it's like you really want to know your market. Don't just don't make any assumptions ever. I mean, even in Baltimore, which is probably like most cities, it could be block by block. I could name a street, Tunbridge Avenue. You're on one one block and you're looking at half million dollar houses. You get five blocks away on the same street. And you're looking at board ups that are worth 50 at the most. Hmm. Same street name, same, same zip code, four or five blocks apart. One block, you got section eight crackheads. The next block, you know, four blocks, five blocks down, you got like doctors and lawyers. Wow. Same street. Wow. So, so which comps do you think the wholesaler is going to use? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, $500,000 after repair value. You know? <laughs> it's yours for 90000 You know, it's like, I don't think so. Uh, Mark, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for this time. Thanks for um, your humility, your vulnerability, and sharing some some great life lessons and some great real estate tips. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Now you're absolutely welcome, man. I wish everybody the best. Thanks, dude.